almost 20 years as a newspaper reporter and an editor, and I can still recall the strong whiff of the male-dominated newsroom. So I, I can understand this. Um, talk a little bit about uh, all the sexism that you've noted in the book that, that Mary experienced, but how she rose um, through the ranks from an assistant book critic in, in 1947 to a prominent Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist uh, at the Washington Post. Yeah, you're right. It's really remarkable. She was told again and again that a uh, newsroom wasn't a place for a nice girl from, from Boston. Uh, uh, one of her early editors told her she was too shy to cover politics, which is uh, pretty incredible for anybody who knew her later in life. Uh, even before her first big breakthrough on the Army McCarthy hearings, her editor sat down and said, well, Mary, are you planning on having uh, kids and getting married and settled down? And she said, well, you know, maybe someday, uh, uh, but I don't have any immediate plans. And his response was, well, if you're not going to get married and settle down and have kids, then, then we'll give you more responsibilities and, and cover the Army McCarthy hearings. Uh, she got a job offer from the New York Times at one point, a uh, uh, famous uh, reporter, columnist, Scotty Reston, who ran the Washington Bureau at that time. Uh, Mary was already a very well-known reporter at this point. He wanted her to answer the phones uh, in the morning uh, if he was going to bring her on staff. Women weren't allowed in the National Press Club. Most of the places uh, Mary went on the campaign trail, she was the only woman or uh, one of uh, one, two or three on the plane. You know, and she just really persevered. She uh, wrote beautifully. Uh, she had a gift for it, uh, and she was really just unwilling to take no for an answer. And uh, it was really amazing that the reception she got from a lot of male reporters that, uh, you know, she pushed and said, well, you know, if you guys aren't going to treat me the same way uh, because I'm a woman, you can carry my bags, you can help me out, you can carry my typewriter. Uh, and it was really a great testament to just uh, her force of will as an individual. Yeah, and as you said, it's certainly a lot different back then. You mentioned the, the press club, club. And flash forward to 1998, I believe, the club awarded Mary its, its highest honor, the Fourth Estate Award. Yeah, it was uh, a nice turn of events. And uh, uh, when she started out in Washington, uh, women were only allowed uh, in the press club if they were brought up the back stairs uh, and sat in the eaves uh, up with the hot television lights. They weren't allowed to sit down on the floor. They weren't allowed to have a meal. Uh, they had to brown bag it if they want there. Uh, to have a meal while they were covering the event. Uh, and ironically, it was Nikita Khrushchev who pushed to have women uh, be given access to uh, his speaking event when he visited Washington. And to Mary's credit, uh, she certainly was a voice. Um, she seemed to guide a great deal of the, the national conversation in her time. And whether that was mocking um, Senator McCarthy as an Irish bully boy or uh, winning the Pulitzer for her commentary on Watergate, uh, she was a real DC insider. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. One of the things that really stood out and was fascinating to see uh, as I look back at the, the transcripts and the historical record was the number of times that Mary really did drive the conversation. Uh, there were White House tapes. Uh, uh, Nixon wasn't the only one with a White House taping system. Uh, but LBJ of calling his press secretary uh, into the Oval Office and calling him on the carpet and saying, you know, you have to get me right with Mary McGrory. She's killing me in her columns. Uh, he said somewhat famously that uh, she's the best writer in Washington and she's getting better and better at my expense. Uh, Nixon uh, had similar and even more vitriolic reaction. He put her on his enemies list. He unleashed the IRS. Her uh, tax returns were investigated uh, several years in a row. Uh, ironically, she got a slightly higher <laughs> refund uh, because of her charitable giving. Uh, but people really cared what she had to say and write. Uh, and I think it, it really shaped the national conversation in very important ways, uh, particularly with her opposition to the Vietnam War. Uh, it was obviously a controversial issue at the time, but Mary was hardly a hippie. Uh, she wasn't a wild-eyed radical. Her coming out so strongly and consistently against the war, I really think, helped uh, normalize opposition to the war and show that this wasn't just something that the, the youth of America were concerned about. And there were many facets to Mary. She was a, a Boston Irish Catholic who had conservative views when it came to the church, and yet here she was a liberal in the newsroom. Could you talk a little bit about how that influenced her style? You know, her faith was enormously important to Mary. She was somebody who uh, got down on bended knee and prayed by the side uh, her bed before she went to bed every night until her uh, knees wouldn't allow her to do it anymore. Uh, but she never proselytized. You would never know that Mary was uh, a particularly uh, 
uh, person of faith from her columns. Uh, but I think that sense of social justice really illuminated her work, that she thought that uh, being a person of faith, that you need to do good works. You needed to stand up for the little guy. You needed to uh, fight injustice. And I think that really came through uh, in her columns. And you mentioned before that she had made Nixon's enemies list. And obviously, through her five-decade career, she must have made a lot of enemies. And that's a testament to her good reporting. But she also had some admirers, including one in the White House. Could you talk a little bit about that, um, perhaps not so delicately put, pickup line? Oh, sure. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, after he assumed the presidency, uh, was quite eager to court Mary, both uh, professionally and personally. Uh, as I said, he'd call his press secretary into the Oval Office and yell at him for uh, Mary's columns. Uh, but in a somewhat famous incident, uh, Mary was at home in her apartment off of Connecticut Ave in Washington one night. Uh, she got a call uh, from someone saying that they were the Secret Service and that President Johnson was going to stop by her apartment in several minutes. Uh, Mary naturally assumed that it was one of her colleagues from the old Washington Star pulling her leg and that it was a prank. Uh, but lo and behold, she looked out her apartment door and there were Secret Service agents uh, uh, by the elevator down the hall. Uh, and LBJ uh, wandered into her apartment. They sat down, they had a couple drinks, uh, and Lyndon Johnson said, you know, I'm crazy about you, Mary, uh, and expressed his great romantic feelings for her and, and clearly wanted to uh, be involved with her romantically. But it being LBJ and him being uh, incredibly clumsy in some ways, uh, basically framed his pickup line as, you know, I know you love the Kennedys, now you should love me. Uh, and it has to be how about the worst <laughs> pickup line I can imagine uh, for almost anybody, but particularly for Mary. Uh, Mary said politely, I, I respect you, Mr. President. You've got enormously important work to do. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, they finished their drinks and, it, and he went on his way. And I don't think he ever made much headway either romantically or professionally in changing Mary's mind. We're heading up to the presidential elections. I know they're almost a year away, but it seems like there's a debate every week and all the debates about the debates. What would Mary say about the situation now and some of the candidates, considering she dealt with the likes of the Kennedys and Lyndon Johnson? Well, I mean, first I would imagine that Mary would get on bended knee and and thank the Lord above for presenting her with such wonderful material as we see in this uh, current primary season. Ben. Carson, Donald Trump, uh, Hillary, Jeb, uh, it's, a, it's a pundit's dream in terms of uh, wanting to produce columns. You know, Mary was fairly tough on uh, reporters and journalists in their performances at debates. Uh, she thought that too many journalists and reporters used it as a chance to preen and try to look smart. She thought that questions, questions should be simple. Uh, she should be direct uh, and let the candidates have, have their say. Uh, but at the same time, she felt very strongly uh, that candidates benefited from standing in front of the public and explaining their position, from using the bully pulpit, from making their case repeatedly to the American public. Uh, and this idea, particularly that we've seen in the GOP primary, that the uh, people asking the questions should be vetted, uh, that there shouldn't be tough follow-up questions, uh, that they should be seen as favorable to the candidates, uh, she would have wildly objected to that. Uh, you know, she knew that politics is a contact sport, and she understood that both journalists and politicians need to be out there in the fray. Uh, and you're probably not going to be a very good president if you're afraid of questions from a reporter. Well, an amazing woman, a terrific book, Mary McCrory, the first queen of journalism. John Norris, thanks so much for a few minutes. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Coming up next, we'll have Hudson Valley headlines, so please stay with us.